Uh, this is our last one before we break for lunch. So I just need a little bit more of your attention, but we've got a very, very good one to end the breakfast and the morning sessions with. This guy here is an OG in the Magento community, but he's going to tell you a lot more about that in his presentation. Um, over his 20-year career, he really has maintained an interest in security, he was telling me, with a focus on defensive development. You may see his face earlier on in Marsh's presentation in the general session, but you're about to see a lot more of it on this stage right here. I'm delighted and honored to introduce Talesh Sleep Arson. Hey guys, um, yes, I'm not gonna be there. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, it's been a long three years with no Magento events, so because I have a little bit extra time, I'm just gonna take a few minutes right now and just recognize the fact that we're finally here after three years, no events, and you know, the entire community may have languished a little bit in the last couple of years, so I'm so excited to be back here and be part of this. And uh, yeah, the organizers for this uh, event has been saying I'm a um, OG and I've been doing this for a long time and I'm a veteran at this and it's starting to make me feel like I'm old and maybe I shouldn't be doing this anymore. But and I, to be honest, I've considered not giving a talk at this event um, or not even speaking at events anymore. And I just assume it's because maybe I had nothing else to say. I've, I've I've said everything I, I, I could say about Magento security. But in my, my work as you know, someone who audits Magento stores for security or who does incident response for breach stores, I started noticing a trend about three or four years ago. And it's a, a, a pattern of either breaches or vulnerabilities in Magento stores that started showing up. And it was the same problem kept on showing up. And then I noticed that the secondary problems were related to the first batch. And it's consistently been showing up. And I've been thinking, I'm like, hmm, Magento itself as a code base has been really secure in the last five, six years. Like a lot of work has been done. But the, the problems I've been seeing in my field where I have a little bit of an insight into most of the stores that have security issues have not been Magento problems. So I'm like, okay, maybe this time I will give a talk about why the recent Magento security issues are not actually Magento issues and what uh, either merchants or agencies could be doing about it. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's probably not the best uh, topic to be at Meet Magento, saying, okay, I'm not going to be talking about Magento, but I'm specifically not going to be talking about Magento code. Because as far as I'm concerned, Magento Adobe has put so much effort, an amazing amount of effort, making the code part of Magento, the Magento core, one of the strongest parts of any merchant's offering. Um, any Adobe employees here? Cheryl's here? Just Cheryl? Okay, so Cheryl, you're gonna have to take this for all of Adobe. <laughs> um, I know there's been a lot of churn in Adobe and definitely not you, but the reason this is a slide I could have is because we've had a bug bounty program and Magento has supported people in the community reporting bugs in the core to Adobe. And if <coughs> Adobe ever tries to get rid of that bug bounty program, this slide may never ever show up again. So I'm gonna defend the bug bounty program to the end of my days, despite the fact that I personally don't submit bug bounties to Adobe. I don't have any money in this game. I'm just doing it for what's right for the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, this is probably a little bit of a controversial slide. Uh, by the way, slides are already online. You could grab them at that URL. You could scan that QR code if you wanna take the risk of scanning a QR code from somebody who's talking about security. I don't know what it is. I just put it into a, like a QR code generator and it gave me that. I personally have not scanned it, so I don't know. Um, but the slides are already online. Uh, um, everyone's grabbed that. Uh, yeah, and while I'm you know, doing meta stuff, uh, the name of the talk is Your Code is Secure, but what about everything else? My name is Talish Siparasan. Um, it says security consultant there, um, although technically my business title is not a hacker. 
Um, so so let's, let's get into it. We have, in when I do security audits, I'm going to start, I'm going to cover four problems that I'm seeing in stores that have nothing to do with the Magento code. And we're going to start with the ones that are most common and easy to fix, the ones that send, uh, I'd say the send merchants scrambling at the beginning. And we're going to get into the, the second, third, and by the time we get to the fourth one, it's a little bit more involved to fix, and it's a little bit more effort, but I, it's just as important. And interestingly, the first one is the human beings involved in, uh, in any Magento store. <laughs> um, uh, and sneak peek, the last one is also human beings. <laughs> human beings are generally the problem. Um, but because human beings are so complex and fascinating, I've had to split them up into two sections. The most common problem, hands down, if I see breach stores, if I do a security audit for a Magento store, has been the human beings. And specifically, who has access and what do they have access to? Now, this may seem simple, but I'm going to start asking a couple questions and you will see how complex this gets at least from my point of view as a security auditor. So when you think who has access, the first thing you probably would be thinking is like, who has access to my Magento admin? You know, um, maybe you only want people in your organization to have access to your production Magento admin. But um, what about past employees? Do you have a process for removing them from your Magento admin? Uh, incredibly common. This one usually sends merchants scrambling right away. And you know, not, it's not only past employees, it's like, do you have new employees who have access to the Magento admin that you probably shouldn't have given access yet? I'm seeing some faces of consternation way too early in this talk. <laughs> you guys should not be looking this worried. Because <laughs> there's a lot to cover. Um, who else has access to your Magento admin? Maybe some external resources. Did, did you have a maybe an uh, external agency you hired last uh, shopping season to help you get some work done, and maybe three other devs still have access to image into admin. This sort of thing prop crops up even more than you expected. And I'm talking about worldwide household names. I've looked at the Magento store, and I'm like, who are these three people, and why do they have access to admin? So even if you have a smaller store and you're not well-known world worldwide, it's something that exists, and it's a constant problem. Um, again. Like, what about module support? Have you ever had a module where it's giving you problems and you get in touch with support and they're like, yeah, I just create us an account and admin and we'll be able to debug it from there. And you say, yeah, okay, you do it. you like, we got to get this done. Black Friday's coming up. And then two years later, that person still has access to your Magento admin. Now, I may sound like the crazy security tinfoil hat guy, but the fact of the matter is I've seen stores hacked like this because there's one or two emails that I scan for every time I, I do an audit. Um, I'm not going to reveal who it is or which company it is, but I do know one or two users in North America who've had admin accounts on multiple stores, and the, fa the hackers have figured out his password. And they just, they just scan all Magento admins that they have access to and try to log in as him. Um, that's a really bad thing if I know who you are personally. I'm not going to say who it is. <laughs> but the thing is, it happens. And I've seen stores hack like this. So you, you, you need to have some sort of audit process around users in your admin. But um, it's not only Magento. What about what do they have access to? Jenkins. Maybe you have all employees and you are Jenkins. Maybe some external agencies still have access to your Jenkins. This is still part of your Magento development experience. Um, how, many, how many people have access to your repos? I mean, are there random, random people who have access to repos? And then you start getting deeper and deeper. It's like, what about my composer packages? Um, I don't know how many people use JFrog or any sort of artifactory to keep an eye on the code that goes into your Magento store. But all those four categories of users I talk to who should not have access to your Magento admin, we, you need to be keep an eye on like, you know, what else they, they should not have access to. And this is the big one, SSH keys. When I do an audit and I get into SSH access to a production server and I ask who is admin at 
work group 5A2, computer 67A3, and nobody knows, and there's 16 of those SSH keys on a production server, it sends people scrambling, and it's a really bad look. Um, a, a lot of like, sometimes clients are like, um, you know, embarrassed about the fact that they have a bunch of SSH keys lying around on their production server and they have no idea who it is, or it's like all employees or something. Um, not something to be embarrassed about, but just like something to learn. Um, but SSH keys are a big thing because nobody really audits them, nobody knows, unless you've generated an SSH key on like a certain user on some types of platforms, sometimes you don't know which, who an SSH key is. Uh, belongs to, or if probably somebody generated an SSH key on a Windows machine and that machine got breached, and now the the attacker on that Windows machine has you know a bunch of servers they've connected to. Um, this is a big deal because SSH keys are kind of keys to the kingdom if you're not running on like some sort of like Dockerized envir environment. And another one is um, APIs. APIs is a it's, it's, a, it's a something that it's always skipped. It's a, users like, they generate API keys on production servers for a service, then stop using it, and then when you, you add, audit the admin, there's like seven services with API keys out there that should not have access to Magento APIs, but the keys are still there, and it's not something that's looked at by developers at all. Mind you, I have not talked about Magento code. It's just the patterns of human behavior that we've had problems with, and this is what's been um, coming up in a recurring manner in the last three to four years, because Magento itself has been pretty locked down. And this is, a, this is another big one. I say random scripts. Most times these present themselves as like Terraform, CloudFront, Chef, Puppet. If you, if you use any sort of orchestration software, sometimes those scripts have credentials in them that they should not have or credentials that are just way too grand. And I was just gonna like say, yeah, you know what, don't put passwords in your scripts. But then in the last week, we've had Uber get hacked. And the real key the hacker got into Uber is they got a hold of a script with an admin password on it. And they were able to use that password and just breach everything. Everyone's heard about the Uber hack. It's been big and it's been public. But to break into a company this large, to that extent, and it all hinged on the fact that one admin had a password in a script, in a random script, and keys to the kingdom. Um, another issue, and it kind of goes back to new, new employees, is passwordless. Some, some companies use passwordless authentication for various services. So anybody with a domain email address has access to a service. Um, less common, but I have seen, seen this a problem where um, People on probation who, you know, has been working with a company for only two days had full access to production server because they could use, log in using some sort of passwordless flow. So things that controls should be around, and I'm not seeing it when I do audits or incident response. The second big thing I'm seeing is access control. It kind of goes, uh, no, let's go back. It kind of goes hand in hand with who has access that shouldn't have access, but what do they have access to? And most people think the first thing when they say access control is the Magento admin because there's something called access control. You could, you know, I pull this on Magento DevDocs. There's tutorials that explain to you how to build proper access control into your Magento modules. But um, the problem is there are some sloppy tutorials on the internet that just give you terrible advice when it comes to building access control because people are focused on building stuff and not how to build it properly. And when we have developers rushing to meet that deadline, Black Friday is coming up, or like you know something's late, and they just you know relying on a tutorial on the internet that doesn't take security into mind, and they rely on sloppy tutorials. That's when access controls become a problem. The the second thing with access control is the the systems that interact with your Magento store. Um, obviously, your browser interacts with your Magento store. But what about APIs? And I chose a red door that's partially hidden here. Because a lot of people think, OK, we have a mobile app, or we have a PWA, and it interacts with Magento. But those APIs are pretty much like a bright red door that's only partially hidden behind a mobile app. Anybody looking at the traffic between the mobile app and your Magento store would be able to see your APIs. And now the thing is, are you looking at those APIs the way a hacker would? 
Are you, or are you just assuming the mobile app works? QA says the app works. QA says PWA works. So are all GraphQL is okay. Not always the case. Um, Magento, for the large part, you have a REST API, you have GraphQL. Are you using one and not the other? Or are you using both? I mean, should you have GraphQL even enabled if you're not using it? Uh, and the interesting thing about GraphQL is, maybe this is a little bit hard to read. Uh, you could authenticate to your GraphQL requests using tokens or session cookies. The fact of the matter is that you cannot disable session cookies as an authentication method for GraphQL right now until 245. That's the part I have highlighted. Um, so I mean, somebody steals a session cookie, they might have access to some GraphQL uh, calls that some mutations that you may not want them to have access to. Um, and on the flip side, REST APIs. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, REST APIs. Slides missing. That's my fault, not yours. Um, again, with sloppy tutorials, uh, a lot of sloppy tutorials encourage users to build a REST API with guest user API access. And if you're a developer and you know anything about guest user API access, it kind of gives everybody access to that API. And if you're not thinking about who should have access to this API, and you're just following a sloppy tutorial blindly on the internet, um, you're going to make this sort of mistake. And guest user API access is one of the most like, quickest things I turn up when I'm doing an audit. I'm like, why do we have these three custom APIs, and anybody can hit it and write to it? Um, it's not enough to have controls only within Magento. You should have controls on the outside of it also. And that's, what, that's the strategy we, we talk about in the um, InfoSec world is using something called layered defense. And there's a reason why Swiss cheese is, uh, is on this photo, which, by the way, I stole from Adobe stock without credit, crediting them. Um, in InfoSec, we consider any sort of layer as Swiss cheese. Everything has holes in it. But if we have enough layers of Swiss cheese, you can get through all of them. So, so lock down your APIs and also lock it down within the Magento code. And this way, both layers have security around them instead of just relying on uh, access controls within the Magento code. Uh, the second strategy for dealing with problems of access control is something called principle of least access. Um, if uh, somebody in marketing does not need to see uh, customer data, they shouldn't have access to customer data in the Magento admin. If a script that needs to, needs to uh, run, um, run commands on your, your GitHub commits does not need access to deploy, it should not have access to deploy. So everything that needs to do its job should only have access to what it, what it, what it does. Um, zipping along, the third problem, supply chain problems. Again, this is nothing to do with Magento code. Your Magento code is pretty solid, but what we're seeing is Supply chain problems. <clears throat> and this is not the ever given stock in the Suez Canal. Uh, this is modules that you bring into your Magento code that was written by somebody else that may have been breached. And again, this was something that turned up in the last two weeks. Uh, Sansec, which is um, uh, my friend's Willem's company in the Netherlands, they discovered that you know, uh, Linux Trojan was found in a popular Magento extension. And if you install this, you have a Linux Trojan on your production server, which is scary and pertinent because this happened two, two, three weeks ago. Here's the problem. Something like this happened to me like seven years ago. I downloaded an extension, and then all the lights of all my servers lit up like something went wrong. And then I realized that I downloaded an extension that had a um, Windows Trojan or something in it. So here's the thing. Uh, Supply chain attacks are very tempting for attackers because they only need to breach one system to get access to many. So they're willing to put more effort into breaching a system like, say, Fishpig, not to throw them under the bus, but they're just a plain an example, and get access to thousands of stores. So if they put 10 times as much effort, it's still worth it for them, which is why supply chain attacks are very pernicious. Um, one way you can defend against that is using your own artifactory. So running your own packages, uh, status, or if you use JFrog, that sort of thing. So you have control over which packages come in. Um, you can review them and, and integrate them slowly as you know as you know you've you've audited them. 
Um, one other way that I've seen supply chain attacks happen is somebody has an amazingly well-secured store, but somehow their HashiCorp vault got uh, compromised. And then all of a sudden, on Kubernetes, they were deploying compromised Docker, uh, Docker images. Again, it has nothing to do with Magento. It's just the, all the other infrastructure around running Magento are, are, are now part of the attacks that we're seeing. Um, again, the only strategy for dealing with this is principle of least access. But still, it's, when, it's, uh, when I say principle of least access in this context is that the code needs to have least access. Um, but that's enough of our code. Again, oh wait, last pass. Another recent change I've had to make to my, my slides. Um, really good example about this. Uh, just a couple days ago, LastPass gave a, an explanation of what happened to them when they were compromised two weeks ago. And here's what happened. The attacker got access to LastPass developers' environments and the developers' machines. But LastPass is a very secure company. They had such good um, separation of concern, least privilege, that the attacker was able to fully compromise the developer system, but that was as far as they got, because nothing on that system had anything to do with deployments. It had nothing. To, it had to go through um, proper code reviews, code audits before you could even get to, to deployments, and nothing that ha that developer had access to had anything to do with customer passwords or any sort of uh, privilege information. It was so separated that LastPass was able to give a pretty detailed account of what happened in knowing with full confidence that the attacker just got as far as the developer's machine, and that was it. Maybe they lost some code, maybe some company secrets, but at the end of the day, no big deal. Um, a lot of people have a lot more trust in LastPass now because of how well that uh, principle of least privilege stood up to an attack. What could have been a catastrophic attack for example, what happened to Uber. Um, anyway, coming on to the close. The last, fourth big problem I've been, I've been having with Magento stores is, again, human beings. First, we talked about the first example of human beings was um, making sure the correct human beings have the correct access to things. This one is what happens when your human beings who you have given the correct access to things are just being human beings and being you know, sloppy. Weak passwords are no longer a problem with Magento. Um, duplicated passwords are. Because uh, the Magento security issues are not Magento issues. Magento insists that you have a, a strong password and you use 2FA. Amazing, amazing move. Um, something which I cannot celebrate more. The problem is we have duplicated passwords. Um, one password is compromised and then it's, it's being reused. I've kind of covered this already, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, next, the next one is multi-factor authentication is not a perfect solution. Um, here's the reason why. Again, the Uber hack. How the attacker was able to get into Uber, despite the fact that they had multi-factor authentication, was employ something uh, called uh, MFA flooding. They just sent multi-factor requests to the end user over and over and over again. Um, you're, you're there, you're a developer with your phone, and you just keep on getting notifications, um, multi-factor. And then all the, attack, the hacker did was he just messaged the guy and said, hey, you know, we have a bug in our system. You need to accept that MFA, and then it'll stop. Developer accepted it, and the attacker got full, got full access to the system. So. Um, as I said, multi-factor authentication isn't a perfect solution. The problem is human beings are the problem. They, they, you, you, can't, you can't solve a human being problem with technology. And the only strategy for dealing with this is recurring training. Um, and one company that does this really well is Microsoft. When I did some consulting for Microsoft, working for like a gigantic project, uh, Despite the fact that I was hired to do Magento security, every two to three months, I had to do security training and qualify myself to Microsoft that I was aware of all the best security practices. Mind you, I was, I was doing security for Microsoft on a Magento store, and I still had to qualify myself every three months. This sort of thing takes a lot more effort to implement. That's why I said it's one of those things that people don't really get, get, get to, but it's something that 
is a problem that needs to be solved, and we have a strategy for solving it. If your developers know every three months, like, yeah, you know what? These things could be a problem. It's less likely that they will make that mistake. Another very self-serving strategy in the InfoSec world um, that other people who work in my field uh, describe is having a security champion. I think it's really self-serving to call yourself security champions. Um, the way I see it is like my role is more of a security bouncer. It's being able to like listen to what everyone's building, listen to what like you know standups going well. Uh, what are you implementing? Oh wait, wait. Have you um, considered the complexity that convenient little bit you're adding for customers? Um, what what sort of complexity it adds to the system? But the problem is. The more complex your system is, the harder it is to secure. And if somebody is not sitting there, part of your team, day in, day out, um, thinking about the security implications of what you're building, you can add complexity that may end up causing breaches. I'm not going to say it will happen, it may happen. And it's always, you always have that better confidence if somebody's thinking about it. So I'm, I'm not a fan of the security champion title. I'd rather consider myself as a security bouncer because very regularly for my clients, I'm like, but wh why are you doing that? What happens if X and Y happens? So having somebody in your organization to champion that um, is usually one of the good strategies to deal with the fact that human beings can be fallible. So to recap, because we're coming up to the end, um, big problem, human beings. Human beings who have access to stuff that they should not or human beings who have access to more than they should. The second problem is access control and getting it right. Being able to determine which human beings have access to what they need and which scripts have access to what they need. Third problem, supply chain. Having a control over a supply chain. Least privilege and making sure you have all the layers in place. And again, last problem, human beings. The strategy for dealing with that is training and identifying somebody or hiring somebody like me to be the security bouncer in your organization to say, okay, you want to build that? maybe you should think about X, Y, and Z security problems it may introduce. Um, and that's it. That's, that's a big deal of what I'm seeing happening in the Magenta world. It's not Magenta code anymore. It's, it's all of these, these parts of the ecosystem around Magento that are becoming the problem. Um, and that's it. Uh, my name is Salary Subarasan. You could get in touch with me on Twitter. I will much more likely respond to you on Twitter over email because I have already de declared email bankruptcy this year. I'm not going to do it again. And, and there's a QR code if you're brave enough to scan it. It's not a rickroll, I can promise you that. Um, yeah, and that's it. Any questions? Whoa, no questions. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So the question is if, if I would recommend SSO through Google um, instead of customer login. Uh, this, this is where we get back to should new employees have access. If you're using, using SSO through Google and you automatically give anybody with a Google account in your organization access, like how much, how much granular control do you have over that, right? I think it's a really good idea. It's just that you need to think about who with Google accounts have access to what. Right? And if, Google is, if SSO using Google is not going to give you that, probably it's not the best bet, right? Sorry, I meant like as a customer, not like employees that have a marketplace store. Yeah. And I want to, like, instead of having the Vento, like customer accounts. Yeah. Um, I just had like SSO through Google or any other provider. Uh, is it bad to give Google the data? Is it? I have not reviewed the Google implementations. I'm assuming they are well implemented. Um, that's your, your biggest concern if you're doing that. Obviously, SSO with Google is a convenience factor. And as I said, convenience adds complexity. Complexity makes it a little bit more diffi difficult to secure. Right? Um, it's a discussion to have kind of with your organization is what's our risks around that, and are we willing to assume those risks? Personally, I do SSO with Auth0 slash Okta, and it's an organization I trust. Google, I would probably trust very much. Microsoft, I trust. These are big core organizations with a lot more to lose than me and my Magento store. So is that a too long question for what you're expecting, yes or no? I have a follow-up. <laughs> okay, go ahead. 
let's say I am a customer, yep. forgetting that I work in the industry. Yep. Should I feel comfortable, like, if a, if a website has SSO options for convenience, should I feel comfortable doing that, or should I always be relying to create an account? Um, in general, most of them implementations are safe and secure. Uh, personally, as me, as a customer, I see it more of a privacy question as opposed to security question. No one's going to throw up Google SSO if they, they can't do it properly. I, at least I hope so. Um, but do I want to share the fact that I've signed up to this e-commerce site with Google? Um, do, do, I want to, do I want to start sharing that? So it's, 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 there's privacy and there's, there's security. Um, so yeah, there's two, two halves to that question. I'd say yes in some cases. If you're going to be shopping on something you don't want anyone to know about that may affect your health insurance, maybe not. So, any other questions? Uh, so, have you seen anyone do a good job in terms of problem number three of supply chain, uh, doing like a software bill of materials for Magento? Um, it's a hard question for me to answer because I used to have a software product that did that, that did not survive the pandemic. Um, so basically, you're asking me to recommend my old competitors to you. <laughs> um, uh, within, uh, to be honest, I'm going to have to get back to you. I can't remember which ones really like clobbered my business. But uh, um, most of the big in InfoSec like, uh, scanning tools, they do have something that will monitor your supply chain. The reason I recommended having your own JFrog or Satis or Packages is so that you can do it. Um, as opposed to paying somebody else to monitor your supply chain, you could do it yourself. Um, there's advantages to having another company do it because then you could just you know, offload that responsibility. But off the top of my head, I can't recommend any right now. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I have your contact information. I'll go look it up and I'll send it to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, yeah.